Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Tracy Alexander. And coming up in today's newscast, Israel is looking less than well on the world stage in its handling of COVID-19, plummeting from among the best to close to the worst. Police use of water cannons in the spotlight after another day of anti-government protests produced some disturbing images. And taking flight from Israel's Ben Gurion airport, a 72-year-old recovered coronavirus patient participating in an unprecedented hot balloon launch. At risk of sounding like a broken record, Israel breaking personal records again this weekend with a continually rising coronavirus infection count. The Jewish state now ranking sixth in the world for daily infections per capita. Aaron Parrish reports. From outright best to nearly the worst, Israel's current ranking for its response to the deadly coronavirus has fallen dramatically. The New York Times showing that now only the United States, South Africa, Panama, Bahrain and Oman are experiencing the outbreak worse than Israel, with thousands of new infections reported daily. Israel's total numbers sit just under the United States, with less than 200 new daily cases per million people. Total cases of the disease in Israel have officially surpassed 61,000, with no signs of slowing. Nearly 34,000 Israelis are actively sick, about 330 are in serious condition, and the death toll has risen to 464. According to some experts, though, the mortality rate has fallen since the start of the pandemic, from over 2% to 0.8%. The explanation they're giving for this trend is that authorities are now detecting a growing number of asymptomatic carriers, and hospitals are also better prepared to treat the seriously ill. A lot of discussion, but not much action, though. No definitive response or course of action has been outlined by the government. The yo-yo decisions around lockdowns leaving heads spinning and virus cases climbing. From day to day, areas closing, opening, closing, opening, closing, and opening. The back and forth doing little to shift the picture. The Knesset's coronavirus committee now voting to overrule the cabinet's decisions for the second time in a month, repealing shutdowns on gyms and fitness centers. Gyms, pools, eateries, and other businesses have been protesting government closures for being targeted unfairly, with the Knesset COVID committee agreeing amidst a lack of clear evidence to suggest that these places are a danger to the public. Closures on zoos, museums, and beaches have also now been overruled. Now, what began as Israelis frustrated with the government's handling of COVID-19 has now inflated into almost daily demonstrations, but losing focus, now expressing a more general dissatisfaction with the system as a whole. The images of police working to keep the crowds at bay and claims of protesters being attacked by pro-Netanyahu protesters as authorities concerned things are getting out of hand. Here's more. Another day, another protest. This time, thousands gathering outside Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's residence demanding his resignation. Police charged with ensuring the right to demonstrate and maintaining order are being deployed in large numbers on foot, on horseback and with increasing frequency using water cannon fire to disperse the crowds. This tactic though beginning to draw sharp criticism, especially after clips like this one showing a protester's neck snapping back from the force of the water hose. Protest organisers accusing police of using disproportionate force, claiming the tactic has led to severe injuries in demonstrators, like direct injuries to the head and other organs. As protesters vow to take the matter to the High Court if it continues, the Prime Minister is taking to Facebook to slam Israeli TV news channel 12, calling it propaganda for the anarchist left, accusing the media of overinflating the numbers of protesters and fanning the flames for left-wing funded political protests. Benjamin Netanyahu using the now popular fake news slogan saying shame, shame, shame. 
Making up the thousands strong demonstrations overnight, no longer just business owners and striking sectors of the workforce, now many secular Jerusalemites have joined, plus students and others in their 20s and 30s. Analysts now categorising the pushback as an unfocused expression of frustration and despair. We're protesting not against somebody specific, although our Prime Minister, Bibi, Benjamin Netanyahu, is just a symptom of the problem. What we're trying to say is protesting against the whole system, the whole regime that is ignoring us, that is not letting us express ourselves, that's calling us anarchy. While extremely noisy, the demonstrations have been good-natured, with a violent minority and a speckle of far-left political extremists, those making the headlines. And adding to the tension, much smaller gatherings of pro-Netanyahu activists spouting vitriol from the other side. Several activists taking part in demonstrations against the Prime Minister overnight reportedly attacked in separate incidents, sparking calls for authorities to protect them. And joining me now with more is international spokesperson for Israel's police, Mickey Rosenfeld. Mickey, a, a pleasure to have you with us as always. Now talk us through the pictures that we're seeing here. Why are the police using this tactic of water cannons, which you can see by the imagery, uh, is incredibly forceful when sprayed directly at a person? Well, what we've seen over the last almost two weeks in the area of uh, the centre of Jerusalem near the Prime Minister's residence, we've seen a protest which took place fully coordinated with the Israeli National Police, but there were clear boundaries and borders as to where the protesters would be, would be and also as to what time the protest would finish. At the time where the protests were finished, as far as we're concerned, it's called an illegal demonstration, and therefore police requested from all the demonstrators to leave the area as quick as possible. Unfortunately, after requests that took place time after time, Slowly but surely, our units moved in, number one, by removing people hand by hand from the area. But then when we saw the small crowd, maybe 5% of the total gathering of the people, then we used force in order to remove people. And that includes the water cannons, which were effective in order to make sure that people would leave the area and complete the protest. And what do you say to the accusations that excessive force is being used by the police? I don't agree with that. The Israeli police respond according to what is taking place on the ground. When there are disturbances that take place and when there are protesters that are not leaving the area, we make arrests slowly but surely, one by one. By one. That's what we did. But unfortunately, what we saw that took place, especially over the last two weeks in Jerusalem, more than in the area of Tel Aviv, uh, we saw small groups, extremists that were breaking the law. They were calling our police officers Nazis. They were throwing objects at our police officers as well. We've had officers that have been sprayed uh, with uh, pepper spray as well and being injured. And therefore, it was absolutely vital to make arrests of those specific leaders, individuals who are roaring up those protests to a level that we don't want them to reach. I can also confirm, and it's very important, people who want to protest have the right to protest, but it has to be done within the framework of the law and the regulations that are being impl implemented. Also, the health regulations as well, which means wearing masks and keeping social distance as much as possible. Now, Mickey, according to a Channel 13 uh, report, Public Security Minister Amir Ohana has, in fact, accused the police, on the other hand, of being too soft on these protesters that, are, of course, are demonstrating against the Premier. The report cites a meeting on Wednesday night uh, with Interim Police Commissioner Monty Cohen, and Ohana is quoted as saying, if this was a protest by ultra-Orthodox people or Arabs or Ethiopians, would you, meaning the police, have acted the same? What can you tell us? Have you been told to use more force against the protesters? No, absolutely not. The uh, Israeli National Police respond to the level of violence that takes place. We also dealt with, just in fact, last week, in the middle of the week on Wednesday evening, there were disturbances within the ultra-religious Haredi community in Jerusalem, where we had 12 arrests that there took place at the scene, and we had officers also injured there. There were serious disturbances. We respond according to the level of violence, and of course, depending on what is taking place in terms of crowd control. It's very important that things don't get out of hand. Uh, two weeks ago, we saw a small group, which was not the majority of the protesters who had in fact made their way peacefully, but a small group who had made their way into town and they caused disturbances, they threw objects at police, they caused damage to shops, and that is something which is totally unacceptable uh, in any normal society.
Mm. Now, uh, Mickey also reports that pro Netanyahu demonstrators are in fact attacking the anti uh, Netanyahu demonstrators. What's going on and what's going to be done uh, to protect at least the protesters from each other? That's correct. There were scuffles that took place uh, yesterday evening, for example, and also on uh, uh, Saturday night we saw as well disturbances uh, by local individuals who had just come there not just to look and film what was going on on the other side of the protest, but they came themselves to take part in the protest. We made a number of arrests. Six people were arrested before they were involved in any public disturbances. There were a number of people that uh, had, uh, had scuffles with one another, which we had to deal with, but that is something that is understandable because of the tensions going on. Our main emphasis at the moment, and the main aim of the Israeli police, and especially in Jerusalem, not just in Tel Aviv, is to try and make sure that, number one, the, the protests will take place, but it has to be civilized, it has to be respectful, and it has to be according to the coordination which is being made with the Israeli police, just like in any protest, and there's no differentiation, whether it's within the Christian community, the Muslim community, or the Jewish communities. All right, Mickey, thank you so much for that information. Thank you. Now, the Likud and Blue and White have been waging a battle of accusations over who's responsible for the fact that there's no agreement between them on the state budget. Now, to remind you, Blue and White wants a budget for a year and four months. It says that this will ensure the stability of the system and of the economy. The Likud, on the other hand, it insists on a short budget for just four months. Now, this choice giving the Prime Minister a way out of the coalition agreement reached between the two parties, therefore potentially stripping Benny Gantz of his chance at leadership. Now, to understand the consequences of failing to reach an agreement, I'm joined in studio by Jerusalem Bureau Chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, Alex Trayman. Alex, a pleasure to have you. Thank you. First of all, give us a bit of background for those not aware of the Israeli political system, why not agreeing on or reaching a decision on uh, the state budget could lead us to new elections. Well, not agreeing on a state budget within a certain deadline is an automatic trigger for a new election within a parliamentary government. As part of the agreement between the Likud and Blue and White that has a complicated rotation, the agreement was that there would be a two-year budget, Netanyahu trying to pass a budget only for the remaining months of this year in order to give a secondary trigger, mm -hmm. uh, which might throw Israel into yet another election in several months from now after they get through the first mm -hmm. portion of a shorter one-year budget. Mm -hmm. So it would benefit if Israel went back to the polls? I don't think anybody would benefit if Israel went back to the polls. We've already had three consecutive polls within one year's time. Uh, of course, Netanyahu does not want to hand the reins of the premiership over to Benny right. Gantz, which is scheduled to happen in November of next year. Uh, so I believe that he wants to maintain a potential trigger uh, to get out of the agreement. Certainly, uh, but the why then, if, that, if, if his intention is, of course, to lead Israelis and to look after Israelis, why then would he want to trigger a new election if it won't actually benefit the general public? Well, I think that right now they want to pass a short budget. Uh, because everybody recognizes that going to the elections doesn't stand to benefit anybody, and the chances of a deadlocked political situation like we had before this unity government would continue. However, they're hoping that the coronavirus will stabilize, and then at such a point they could focus on other issues of governance, and then they might want to reevaluate the budget and potentially trigger a new election. What signs already exist that this is going to happen, that we are in fact headed towards early elections? Well, you see that Israel is sort of paralyzed by unity. Mm -hmm. You have two opposing forces inside the same coalition, and each side has both advanced parliamentary legislation that was sort of outside of the realm of the government. Blue and White last week voting in favor of a controversial conversion therapy mm -hmm. bill. Several weeks before, we could bringing to the table a bill that would sort of strip the judicial system of some of its authority. Both of those uh, parliamentary initiatives are outside of the realm of a very limited uh, centrist agreement. Now, is there a chance that the three strong men sitting on the opposition, we have here, Ir Lapid, Naftali Bennett, Avigdor Lieberman, that they could band together uh, to ensure that this, this election goes forward? Uh, looks very unlikely. Uh, right now, we could and Blue and White both do hold this government together, and even though things do look bad on television, as Benny Gantz said, there are things mm. that are happening behind the scenes. The country is in a pandemic situation, mm -hmm. and really, 
all forces need to be cool-headed right. and uh, just sit together for the time being. Very briefly, though, Benny Gantz said he'll do everything in his power to avoid going uh, to another round of elections. What can he do, though? Well, uh, Benny Gantz probably stands to lose the most if mm. Israel goes mm. to an election. The current polls show Netanyahu holding at 35 seats, pretty similar to what the Likud has now. Uh, Benny Gantz polling all the way down below 10 seats. So. His party would be far from the seat of power if another election was true. Well, let's see what he can pull out to prevent that from happening. Alex Trayman, thank you for that insight. Thank you. Well, the IDF is boosting its presence on the country's northern front. IDF Chief of Staff Lieutenant Aviv Kochabi touring northern Israel Saturday, less than a day after the military upped its alert in the Northern Command, concerned about a potential attack by Hezbollah. The terror group has been threatening Israel over the death of one of its fighters. And to tell us more, I'm joined in studio by Jerusalem Post defence correspondent Anna Arenheim. Anna, a pleasure to have you with us. Pleasure. Talk us through what the IDF is doing to prepare for potential uh, retaliation, quote-unquote, by Hezbollah up north? So the IDF is really taking uh, from what it's learnt in sub September of last year when Hezbollah fired three anti-tank guide missiles towards IDF posts and ambulance, and they're pulling back some troops from the border, and they're deploying additional troops, reinforcements, to various divisions along the border, as well as bringing in more artillery, uh, more intelligence uh, also putting is the Israeli Air Force on high alert and the Israeli Navy. And uh, Israeli's uh, Navy commander is in fact warning that Israel's gas rigs are a high priority target for Hezbollah. What can you tell us? Well, they're probably not going to be the target mm. uh, for this retaliation. It's likely going to be a military target, meaning um, military vehicles, soldiers, military posts along the border. The gas rigs, which are definitely a target that Hassan Nasrallah Hezbollah's Secretary General has said um, is one of the group's main targets in the next war, right. um, are uh, clearly out there and, and pretty close to shore, uh, and Hezbollah has missiles that can hit that. Right. But right now, they're definitely not a target. And you're saying that they are not the next target, they are not the target of this retaliation, as mm -hmm. though it's a sure thing. It's not a sure thing. Mm -hmm. We don't really know what uh, Nasrallah and Hezbollah is, is planning. But if we look back at what happened in September of last year, and that's what the military is doing, mm -hmm. that's what uh, Kochavi has told troops and has warned troops about, um, Nasrallah has says, you kill our soldiers, we will kill your soldiers. Sure. And so that's why really right now the gas rigs, which are targets in a war, where civilians are also targets by Hezbollah during a war, this is not a war yet. We're just seeing mm. a tit-for-tat type of retaliation. Certainly. The reason I ask that is to ascertain whether this is just hot smoke, because you always hear threats coming from Hezbollah, no real action taken. So talk us through whether Hezbollah really is ready to pull the trigger. Well, Hezbollah has, you know, for years uh, threatened Israel, and Israel has for years uh, in turn threatened Nasrallah and Hezbollah, and, in, and recently even Lebanon, mm -hmm. um, and now uh, Syria, mm -hmm. saying that both Lebanon and Syria will be held responsible for any attack coming from their territory. They're not saying Hezbollah will be responsible. They're saying these governments um, will be responsible for the actions taken by this terror group. Mm -hmm. And it's very likely that Hezbollah, when it says we will retaliate for our fighters killed, mm -hmm. and they take uh, responsibility, not take responsibility, but they identify one of their members as being killed in the strike, it's more likely that they, they will retaliate. We have seen several other Hezbollah operatives killed uh, in southern Syria in the past year. Hezbollah hasn't said a word, mm -hmm. and therefore Israel's military wasn't on alert and wasn't concerned about an attack. But when they take that rare uh, step in saying this was our uh, member, he was killed in Zionist aggression, i.e. an Israeli airstrike. That is something that the military is more concerned about. And, and very briefly before we let you go, I have to ask about obviously the financial situation there that continues to worsen the economic situation. How is that playing into the terror group's mentality? Well, it's kind of uh, two-sided because on one side you have a lot of Lebanese saying, oh, well, what a year. You know, we have corona, we have a disastrous economy, we barely have electricity, we can't cook, we can't, we can't afford to buy food. So what, we have a war with Israel? Mm -hmm. Okay, whatever, it's just 2020. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but at the same time, you do have that seriousness of that economic crisis and Hezbollah, which does play a big part um, in Lebanese uh, political life, it, it, it is very aware that it cannot really just, you know, go off on a whim and do whatever it wants. It has to calculate, okay, well, if 
we take this step and we do bring Lebanon into a war, will we lose that support that we have left? So they're, they're calculating, and Nasrallah is a very smart individual. Uh, you have to give it to him. He, he's remained alive for, mm -hmm. for as long as he has in, in, in the crosshairs of, of uh, the Israeli army. But he's very calculating, and I'm sure right. that we will see a limited response by the group in All coming right. days. Well, Israel's certainly taking no risks and sending those troops up north. So thank you for that insight, Annie. Thank you. Now, three years ago, the Shimon family from Beersheba decided to leave everything behind and travel the world. The parents, Asaf and Efrat, and their four children have already visited some 11 countries and five different continents. But due to the coronavirus, they've been grounded back in Israel for now. But once the world has given them the all clear, they will continue on their way. But luckily for us, Asaf and his eldest son, Amitai, have made a small stop to our studios here in Rishon Sion, and they're joining me now, gentlemen, a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for having us. Well, we're, we're very lucky to have you stuck in Israel because you've come to tell us all about your adventures. How did you get this idea to, to leave everything behind and travel the world with no return date? Well, actually, it was uh, my wife's idea. Uh, she tried to convince me for almost a year. Uh, at that time, I was working uh, full time. The kids were in school. And um, I finally could say broke, broke down and, uh, and accepted. And so uh, we actually uh, sold uh, some of our, our property wow. and uh, rented our home in Modi'in. Mm -hmm. And uh, What was the idea behind it? Why did your wife decide, I want to just take you and the kids away, you know, indefinitely? Uh, it was one of her uh, dreams to travel the world, as most people have. Mm -hmm. And uh, but she wanted to do it uh, with the children, so um, that's why uh, she wanted to do it when they were still young. Right. And Amitai, now I understand that you're 16, and I was saying to your father earlier, I wish my parents did this. How are you finding it? Because you know you're on the road and keeping up with your studies. Uh, I think this is a very uh, a big opportunity for me to learn uh, um, other stuff mm -hmm. than, than you learn in, in school as languages, as my English now. I learn only by the trip wow. and uh, some um, life stuff to learn the, like every, every single thing that I think about right now I learn from the trip, so. Really learning from the world and also how to travel together as a unit. Right. But I think what's really interesting as well is that you're a modern uh, ultra-Orthodox family. You have particular customs and certain things that you want to do and maintain in your lifestyle. How do you do that? You've travelled to countries like China, the Philippines, Taiwan, Vietnam, New Zealand. How have you managed to maintain your customs abroad? Well, uh, it's uh, quite a challenge. It is difficult. And... Um... In each country, you have to learn um, how to uh, manage uh, your diet, uh, if you can go to uh, the shul or to the synagogue, mm -hmm. what you can eat, mm -hmm. what you can't eat. There's a lot of uh, Chabad houses that right. uh, do help. <laughs> All right, well, it's so nice to hear about your story and wishing you the best of luck Thank on you. the rest Thank of your adventure. Thank you. Well, speaking of adventures, a wonderful sight at Israel's Ben Gurion Airport this weekend. This time, morning flights were halted not because of COVID-19, but for the unprecedented event of hot air balloons taking off from the airport's runway. Coronavirus can be thanked, though, for the four balloons getting permission to do so due to the small number of planes taking off and landing. The airport authority reportedly closing the airspace above the airport for the event. Dozens of aviation enthusiasts coming to watch. Now, recently, the IAA has allowed aviation enthusiasts from all sectors, like flying ATVs and ultralight aircraft, to conduct special flights from the airport, which previously could not be possible due to heavy air traffic. Now, here is the exciting bit. One of the participants in the balloon's flight was reportedly a 72-year-old recovered coronavirus patient after being hospitalised in a critical condition. What a wonderful treat. All right, let's take a look at the weather forecast now. Tonight should be mostly clear and warm with lows sitting at an average of 75 degrees Fahrenheit or 24 degrees Celsius. Then tomorrow you can expect partly cloudy skies, but with a rise in temperatures, the highs hitting upwards of around 95 Fahrenheit or 35 degrees Celsius. And now before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. <music> Oh, 
This is absolutely gorgeous. How romantic. What a wonderful couple. Isn't that the way, best way to make dinner? All right, well, that is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.41 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube and Roku TV pages. I'm Tracy Alexander, and thank you so much for watching.